I'd like to focus on this underlying through line that we need to think like philosophers yep. because philosophers themselves have very, very different ideas of what philosophical thinking is or what the practice of philosophy should be like. So analytic yeah, it's philosophers... Only philosopher. Sorry to interrupt you, but you know, that's why I would like to talk with Lee Smolin with others, no? Because people who say this, no, usually say, oh, this is philosophy. Every idiot can deploy his view. But sorry, guys, with science, it's a little bit different. Sorry, look, quantum physics, which is generally recognized as the, with capitalized T, the science today. Sorry, but uh, I will try to, when we will have a conversation with this small in this, isn't it that Concerning uh, determinacy and uh, uh, entanglement and Big Bang and whatever, almost all logically possible versions, solutions, are advocated by today's scientists, who are then in strict disagreement with each other. No? Like uh, uh, the one with whom I first spoke to you, uh, uh, Sean Carroll, no? He mm -hmm. is basically, although he's a little bit more careful, his basic stance is a uh, uh, multiverse, no? Simply yeah. there is no collapse because all, all superpositions are actualized. Then uh, I noticed now how the notion of observation, collapse of super digital superpositions into one reality through observation. But at what level? Thus, observation occur. And I not found with different authors almost all the po all possible solutions. Like at one extreme, I like extremes, that's not a criticism, is Carlo Rovelli, who, and I support him here, who tries to avoid this conclusion, ah, observation means a conscious mind, and no, to reading quantum physics in this idea, idealist, even mystical one. Now, isn't the point of quantum physics that if there is, if reality is collapsed, emerges as a reality that we know only through observation, doesn't this mean that the whole cosmos only exists if there is a big observer, let's say God, and so on? So, uh, Rovelli tries to avoid this conclusion, and I think maybe a little bit too far waters down, makes the notion of observation totally flat. For him, whenever elements interact in reality, they in some sense observe each other. You know, like every, uh, every interaction means that one agent, let's say, who is a victim affected by the other, in this sense, observes the other. Of course, the problem disappears here. But nonetheless, I don't think this totally flat almost notion of observation uh, is strong enough. I don't know where you would stand here. My fear is that you get rid of a problem in almost the same way symmetrically than Sean Carroll's multiverse solution. You know, like... Uh, Everything is observation. Everything that in the reality is observation. The, on the other hand, you have, at least in some of his formulations, Roger Penrose, who is now even moving close to a position of accepting God, of some divine authority, oh, really? a mega observer who guarantees the consistency of our entire cosmos and so on and so on. So again, you need to see, they say, you philosophers, blah, 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 uh, just each of us, each of you has his own theory. But wait a minute, if there is a crazy plurality of theories, again, it's in quantum physics today, you know, and it's science at its top. And my modest proposal here is that precisely we philosophers, and we may be of different orientations, but we who are trained in this Socratic tradition, we can be of some help, not in this totalitarian traditional Marxist sense that a quantum physicist 
will bring me his text, and I will say, sorry, subjective idealism. <laughs> no, no, not to judge, but to, whenever there is a mess in science, and today's quantum physics is one big mess, just to look at it from this Socratic standpoint, you know, and ask, but wait a minute, what do words mean for you? For example, that would be my question to Rovelli and to Roger Penrose. You know, because that's, again, I know, a big problem. For majority of quantum mechanic scientists, they try to avoid direct idealism, but they simply materialize observation in a machine of registration. They say a quantum phenomenon the oscillation, superpositions, is a collapses when it's registered by a machine. Like uh, 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 electron is freely floating, it goes through all possible ways. If you measure it, it's only one way, you know. This solution is, I think, also too simple, but again, what interest me so much is this multiplicity of versions, you know. And maybe we philosophers can do something not in being brighter than them. I still have this, maybe it was felt when I almost fear when I spoke with Sean Kenner and Lee Smolin the first time. Like, I simply respect them. Now, it will sound ridiculous what I will say now, but I think they are much brighter than me and so on. Who am I even to? But I think I can maybe not help them in this, pushing them in the right direction. What the hell do I know? But just, uh, you know, push them philosophically into, please clarify the points. Are, not so much clarify the points. This is still definition, but where some of us philosophers are good is pushing people and Socrates, at least Plato's Socrates was doing this all the time. Pushing people into thinking upon or analyzing the implications and the consequences of what they advocate. Like, you are saying this, but are you aware what will be the consequences of this? That's always my question, not personally, I don't know him at him, but you know when Elon Musk went into that Neuralink, computers will be able to communicate directly with our brain. Okay, I'm too stupid to pass a scientific judgment. Is this possible or not? But my question is, once if machines will be doing this, will we still be thinking? How will this affect our notion of communication? <laughs> <laughs>